Hola a todos, soy Javier Poveda y esto es De Bien TV, el canal donde te lo vas a pasar... Ya no sé qué hacer de bien, mientras aprendes geografía, historia, historia del arte y un poquito de economía y empresarial este año. Este vídeo va dirigido a mis alumnos de primero de sección Ceipso el Encinar de Torrelodones. So, we finish geography and we start history with this video. And we are going to start with the beginning of all, which is... The Paleolithic. We start with the prehistory, and prehistory is divided in several periods. We are going to study the first one, the Paleolithic. So, the first thing we need to know is the process of hominization, which is the series of changes which gradually occur in the human species. Because gorillas, chimpanzees, and we, the human beings, all belong to a group of mammals which is called the primates, los primates, and we all descend from a common ancestor. We don't descend from the monkey or from any of these, of these primates. We have a common ancestor. El que me diga que venimos del mono, me lo cargo, que lo sepáis. So, from that shared ancestry, we Uh, well, several uh, evolutionary changes happened over millions of years, which led to the first human beings, so the first individuals of our species. And this hominization began with the appearance of a bipedal primate species in East Africa. Okay, The first humans came from Africa. And uh, these, uh, these members of this species walk on their back legs, on the las piernas, their legs, not with the arms. So therefore, we, they are considered to be the first hominids. So here we have that all, we are all primates, okay? Human beings and the chimpanzees, the gorillas, the orangutans and the gibbons and many other apes otros simios, but we have a common ancestor. As you can see, we have a separate line of evolution. So we don't come from this, but from this, from a common ancestor. And in this process, we have some um, uh, significant anatomical changes, and we have to know them. First, bipedalism, which is walking in an upright position. It, this gave us a wider field of vision because we, we could see over the buses, over the vegetation, and it left our hands free to use and to develop and to create tools, which we will see later. Then the development of the opposable thumbs. This. The thumb opposes the rest of the fingers which is uh, the ability to press the thumb against the other fingers, okay? And this enables us to hold objects firmly, so it is easier to perform manual tasks and to make tools. We have greater precision. Then the gradual increase in the size of the skull, the cranio, and the brain, the cerebro, which is associated with an increase of intelligence. Also the changes in the larynx here, la laringe, which made the development of language possible, so we were able to speak and to communicate with each other in a complex way. And finally, the use of tools and fire to prepare food caused our jaws, nuestra mandíbula, and teeth, los dientes, to get smaller. Okay? As you can see, this is the main anatomical change, the bipedalism, because we stopped uh, or, or we don't walk with our four, uh, on four legs, on legs and arms as the rest of the apes do. And the, the development of the opposable thumb made it possible to do a power grip and a precision grip, to hold objects firmly and to make precision movements. And this is the growth, the growth of the skull which made the brain larger and also the jaws and the teeth got smaller. So you can compare here the skull of a homo sapiens and the skull of a chimpanzee. 
And in this process of homogenization, we have to study the most important uh, species of hominids, okay? The Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo sapiens. There are a lot of more hominids, but these are the main ones and the ones we need to know, okay? The human lineage, la dinastía humana o el, el, the human lineage, okay? All these five hominids. So we are going to start with the first, which is the Australopithecus. Okay, they lived or they appeared 4.5 million years ago in the Rift Valley, which is this part of East Africa, and they used sticks and sticks and stones, but did not make tools. Okay, we use the objects that there were already in the nature as tools, but they did not create uh, new ones, and they were the ones, the first ones to walk upright on two legs. These are the Lytoli footprints, and we know that they, they were um, they walk upright because of these archaeological remains. Okay, these are the first footprints that we have that we know from uh, a human being. Then the Homo habilis. It uh, lived in the well, all of them live in the Paleolithic. It appeared 2.3 million years ago also in East Africa, and this is the first one to make manufactured tools, to create tools, and also the first one that could speak. And we know that because of the larynx. Okay, then after him comes the Homo erectus, which uh, appeared 1.6 million years ago, also in East Africa, and he was the one who discovered fire and hunted in groups, and this was his appearance. Then the Homo neanderthalensis, or uh, Neanderthal, which uh, appeared 300,000 years ago only in Europe and was extinct only for 40,000 years ago, and this was the first species to uh, make burials, so to bury their death on the ground. And finally, the Homo sapiens, ourselves, which appeared 200,000 years ago, in the end of the Paleolithic, it appeared in East Africa, but expanded to the rest of the world, Asia, Oceania, Europe, and the Americas. And this was the one who started to make art, okay? The paintings. Whoops. Okay, so this, we are here interested in the red part. The Homo sapiens appeared here in Africa 200,000 years ago, and they migrated and colonized the rest of the world, okay? They could travel to America because this part was frozen. And here, this is a more detailed map if you want to dig a bit more in this uh, topic. So, now we start with the periods, prehistory. The prehistory begins with the appearance of the first human beings. Well, uh, actually with the appearance of the first tools, but it's okay. And ended with the appearance of writing. When writing is developed, history starts. So since we have no written documents from this long, very, very long period of time, we have to use other historical sources to study it for example, the human remains and the tools, the archaeology. And prehistory is divided into various periods according to the technology, to the, the, the tools that they created. So we have first the Paleolithic, then the Neolithic, and finally the Metal Ages. In this uh, unit, we're going to study this first part, which is the longest uh, period of human history. So, in the Paleolithic period is the longest period and it covers 99.5% of the history of the human race. It begins with the appearance of these tools which are made of stone, bone and wood, but mainly of stone. That is why um, the Paleolithic and the Neolithic together are usually called Stone Age. And uh, we have this difference, uh, well, for many reasons, but mo one of them is that the tools are made out of napped stone, piedra tallada, okay? And this is the period of the Paleolithic, from 2.500 uh, 2, millions 
uh, no, I mean two millions and five hundred thousand years uh, before Christ and the more or less in the year 8000 before Christ when the Neolithic starts. So this is a video in which um, uh, the flint napping is shown if you want to see it. No, not, to, not now. And we have we have find we have found I mean some uh, tools some paleolithic tools and we have classified them. This is the first type which is, which is a chopper which is a tool used for cutting and in, in uh, it's a tool in which only one side is snapped as you can see here. This is the only side of the stone that is uh, that has some work. We also have a hand axe un hacha de mano which they this is uh, work on the two on the two sides that is why it is also called a, a biface un bifaz or hacha de mano we have arrowheads the ending of the arrows a scraper un raspador for example for the uh, for the heights of the animals a burin un buril to make holes we have also harpoons they are used to fish a needle una aguja un harpoon es un arpón, a spear thrower, um, a tool which is used to throw a spear uh, further away. Here you have a video showing you how it works, okay? Like this. Not today. And, epa, no! Ah. Okay, the, those are one of the most uh, interesting tools. And here in the economy and the society, we have to know that the hominids live in very difficult conditions and they were scavengers, carroñeros, which meant they had to compete with hyenas and vultures, las hyenas y los buitres, for the meat of the dead animals. And later they lived by gathering wild fruit, hunting wild animals and fishing. They were hunter-gatherers, cazadores-recolectores. That is why we call them also predators, depredadores. Why? Because they took the resources they needed directly from nature. They didn't produce anything and lived at a subsistence level because they had just enough to survive. That is why they have they had to move to um, in search for food. When they learned to control fire, the situation improved greatly because they could challenge other predators, they could fight them, and the fire also provides heat, light, and the ability to cook the food. This is how they lived, okay? Gathering fruits and hunting, or well, and hunting and, and eating the meat of the dead animals. Okay, they usually hunted in groups. They are here. They are hunting a mammoth, and here a bear, a wild bear. Okay, a reindeer or a deer, and and they live in these small groups here. And here they are fishing using a harpoon and using arrows and bows. Here, how did they? Um, light a fire. They are, there are two ways, using iron pyrite, um, metallic iron ore, or also, no, not today, or also with dried grasses and doing like this, okay? Venga. And how did they live? How did they organize themselves? Into small groups called clans which were around 10 people, which served family ties, so lazos familiares, and various clans with the common ancestors form a tribe, una tribu. And between them there were no important social differences. They also lived in a nomadic life, which means that they have to move around in search of animals to hunt and of fruit to gather. Okay, When a location ran out of animals or of fruits, they have to move to another location to look for more. Okay, where do they? Where did they live? In uh, outside, in huts made of branches and animal hides, or also sheltered in caves. Okay, many of the archaeological remains are found in caves. Of this uh, coming from this period, these are the huts. Okay, next, for example, to a river in which we they, they can fish, 
and also in caves, okay? And they use the fire to cook these hunting pieces and also to defend themselves from other animals, okay? Aquí un diente de sable. So, we know that they had a religion, and we know that because uh, they, we know that religion appeared when humans tried to find explanations for natural phenomena they could not explain. And we know that because of the pieces of art and because of the burials, okay? The, the first hominids to bury their dead were the Neanderthals, the Homo Neanderthalensis, around uh, 100,000 years ago, which is the oldest known religious manifestations we know about. And usually they buried it, they did with some objects, which are called the grave goods, for example, jewelry or tools next to the corpse. We think, or the specialists think, that they, this is related to some belief about the afterlife, okay? Because they may need these tools or these adornments in the afterlife, okay? That is why we know they have some kind of religious beliefs, okay? This is how a dead, uh, dead body looks like, a burial looks like, and usually they were uh, buried with these grave goods, okay? In, he, in this case, the necklaces or adornments. And regarding art, uh, the most important manifestation of art are cave paintings and portable art. The cave paintings were done in the cave walls or on the cave walls in many pla places. And we know two styles of cave paintings, which are the Franco-Cantabrian style and the Levantine style. The Franco-Cantabrian uh, is, well, they are uh, called this way because of the locations in which they are fine, they are found, I mean. Um, in the Franco-Cantabrian region we have uh, many, many caves with paintings. The most important ones are uh, the ones in Altamira, in Cantabria, and in Lascaux, in France. They were polychrome, which means they use many colors, which they were obtained by mixing mineral dust, o sea, polvo mineral, mineral machacado, with egg or fat, con huevo con grasa, mainly con, uh, with uh, uh, animal fat, to give it consistency. And in, the, in this region, they painted solitary animals in a naturalistic, naturalistic I mean, style which means that they saw nature realistically, okay? They painted the animals just how they saw them, okay? Very realistic way, that is called a naturalistic style. On the other hand, we have the Levantine area on the Iberian Peninsula, so the areas uh, next to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and this kind of, uh, this style of painting is, will appear later, um, mostly at the end of the Paleolithic, the Epipaleolithic, and also in the Neolithic period, okay? We have uh, several caves, the most important one are the la, la Cueva de la Valtorta in Castellón and y La Cueva del Coul in Lerida, okay? And they used few colors and most of, and many of them were monochrome. They only used one color to depict them. They painted in this time, we, ha we can see human figures and animals and usually in hunting scenes. And this style is called also schematic. Why? This is the, op the, the opposite of naturalistic, because they only drew simplified outlines, um, esquemitas, okay? Let's see some examples. This is Las Cobar Altamira, the bisons, okay, with this, they are painted in a very naturalistic way, with uh, black color and red and some yellow, okay? They are painting in Altamira, the paintings are on, on the top of the cave, okay, on the roof, we can say that. Okay, this is the museum, the replica, because right now you cannot visit uh, the original paintings because they are, they are harmed by the photographs. And this is in France, La Cova de Chauvet. Okay, as you can see, naturalistic style. Also, this is a rhino, this is a horse, horses, more rhinos. And we have more horses here. This is a kind in the País Vasco. Santima Miña también en el País Vasco. Okay. Anio in Francia. Lascaux. Here, this is very, 
very beautiful as you can see here. This is also Lascaux, many colors as you can see here, red, black, red and yellow. Okay, this procession of animals painted in a very naturalistic style. And here, this is the Levantine schematic style. We have human figures here. They are very schematic, as you can see, mostly the human figures, and they are depicting a hunting scene. Okay, this is the Laval Torta. Entonces, también la Torta. La Torta, here, you can see the schematic outlines. Okay, they have no detail, as we can, we could see in the franco cantabrian artistic style okay more uh, hunting scene they are this here are dancing we believe that they are dancing okay this is la cueva de la araña this is a woman which is speaking uh, which is gathering honey from these bees here this is another hunting scene de la cueva de la vieja de albacete and we have also some other um uh, styles all over the world. This is, for example, the hands that are painting by blowing the paint on this and using the hand as a mold like this, and you get these outlines of the hand. This is in Indonesia, and also in Australia we have found cave paintings. Okay, oops, and also. Besides these uh, human figures and hunting scenes, in this Levantine schematic style, we can find these points and geometric figures, which we don't really know their meaning, but they are they were painted, okay? Maybe some magical thing, I don't know. Well, we don't know. And also, uh, besides the cave, the cave paintings, we have the portable art, el arte mueble which means that it can be carried from one place to another we can move it okay we consist it well it consists of engravings grabados figurines figurillas and other objects like adornments buttons, blah, 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 blah. the engravings are pieces made out of stone or bone and the an engrave un grabado is a drawing done on a hard surface the stone or bone by making incisions for example with a burring okay so grabar. Figurines, we have they are small statues of, of human figures of our animals were made out of stone, wood, bone, or ivory. Ivory is marfil, and some of them are associated with the fertility worship. Un culto a la fertilidad. We will see some examples later. And in the other objects, we can find adornments or batons of command, bastones de mando, amulets, which are objects that protect from the evil and talisman which are some kind of magical objects okay let's see some of them these are engravings okay this is a, Ven a venus okay because this is related to a fertility worship why because of the sexual um, features are very exaggerated okay for example the breasts and the hips here and this is also an engraving of a lion. It looks like a hippo, but it's a lion. That's what they they said, the experts said. This is also an engraving of a man figure and an engraving of a um, spear thrower. This is the Faon au Oiseau, or como se diga en francés, from the cave of Mas d'Asile in France. Okay, this is and these are engravings, grabados. We have also these figurines, this is the Venus of Willendorf, which is very, very famous, which is related also to a fertility worship because of the big breasts and the hips. Okay, this is very small, like this, I showed you in class. The Venus of Les Pugue, or Les Plugue, or como se diga. The Venus of Rassempuy, these were found in France. Both of them, these are some adornments, these are pieces of a necklace, okay? This is why they have this kind of holes and they are very small, look at this scale. And this is a baton of command, okay? We don't really know that this, what is this used for and many people, many historians think that this is used like a symbol of power, that is why they are called batons of command. And these are uh, amulets uh, made out of amber, the ambar, engraved with these symbols. 
And this is a map with all the Paleolithic sites we have found all over Europe, okay? As you can see, most of them are located in France and in the Iberian Peninsula. This blue area is the frozen area, okay? Because we are here on the Ice Age. And this is a detail of Spain. All of these caves I have shown you and the archaeological sites, you can locate them in the Iberian Peninsula using this map. Okay, the Franco-Cantabrian region here in France and the area next to the Cantabrian Sea and all these Levantine area cave paintings in purple. And this is the end. La Cueva de las Manos in Argentina, which is another example of cave paintings. <coughs> Y con esto hemos terminado con este primer tema fantástico de que por fin ya estamos en la historia, Dios, del Paleolítico, ¿vale? En el siguiente tema veremos el resto de la prehistoria. Como sabéis, cualquier duda me la podéis preguntar o bien por aquí o bien por el resto de mis redes sociales o el aula virtual. Muchas gracias por ver el vídeo y nos vemos en el próximo.